Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending my session after lunch. Uh, so I'll be discussing improving biosecurity and foot and mouth disease control in countries from Asia, the Far East and Oceania. And I'm presenting on behalf of Professor Peter Windsor and we did this activity in conjunction with the OIE. So, um, what is biosecurity and why is it important? I don't think I really need to go into detail because it's been a theme that's been discussed in quite a few of the presentations already at the conference. Uh, but one of the reasons why it is really important, especially in the Southeast Asian context, is that we've got an increasing amount of international trade and animal movements. For example, in 2015, there were at least one million cattle moving from Bangladesh and India through Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, and up into China. We also have a lot of animals moving from Vietnam into the Chinese market as well. And the reason why biosecurity is so important, and I think Keith touched on this quite well um, in the keynote earlier, is that we can't rely on vaccinations to control FMD. You know, they're, they're very important in programs in endemic countries to try and get it under control, but biosecurity will be the key um, moving forward to eradication programs. So quickly, the background of our study. Um, so we did this in conjunction with the OIE. They wanted us to investigate uh, transboundary animal disease control and the role of governments in the private sector. So the aim was to inform you know, methods of improving biosecurity and reporting practices within livestock systems to progress the global control of FMD and eradication. So we conducted this survey in two parts. We did a pilot survey in PAXA in August last year at the 20th OIE CCFMD National Coordinators Meeting. So we got about 11 surveys conducted there and based on the questions and the feedback, we refined the, um, the second survey which was conducted with OIE delegates from Asia, the Far East and Oceania. So that was sent out in an electronic format to the 36 delegates and we got about 27 responses, so it wasn't too bad. The survey had six sections. The first one was covering the respondent demographics and then the next five sections were covering the different principles of biosecurity. And when we did the analysis, we looked at FMD status of the country. So we had them into two groups. So it was FMD free and FMD free without vaccination. So FMD free zones without vaccination. And then we had the FMD countries. So those which were endemic or had free zones with vaccination. We also looked at it um, with World Bank income status. So high income, upper middle, um, low income and lower middle. And then we conducted a binomial logistic regression to identify whether any key practices related to FMD status. So quickly, the five principles of biosecurity that we covered were livestock and quarantine movements, uh, livestock quarantine and animal movements, sorry. So the risk of this is entry of infected animals. And when you're looking at a village or small ho smallholder level, um, this is crucial because a lot of farmers won't buy in vaccinated animals. So it is really important that they do a 14 to 21 day quarantine or isolation. Then people, equipment and vehicle hygiene. So as was discussed in the keynote, humans can act as fomites quite readily. Also vehicles, so trying to promote the washing of vehicles as they're entering and exiting um, villages. And this is really important for traders as well because they can act as a transmission source. Food and water safety, so for diseases like FMD and also HPAI, making sure that water sources are controlled and that they don't, they don't become contaminated with excrement or there aren't wild birds who have access to them. Then we've got animal health management and surveillance and reporting. So treatment... Um, looking at prevention activities by paravets instead of treatment, because what we've seen in our projects, as Keith discussed, was that a lot of our paraveterinary or village animal health workers, they can create a higher income by treating the disease rather than preventing it. And then public awareness training and um, reporting activities. So, and so also recording animal details. So movement controls, recording when you've got animals coming into the system and when they're leaving, and um, you know, public awareness training activities can, can be key in controlling some of these diseases. So the results from our study, we had 11 responses which were FMD free without vaccination um, or FMD free zones with, sorry, I think I've got a typo there. So um, 
FMD free countries and those free without vaccination, 15 from FMD free zones with vaccinations or F endemic FMD countries. So the results indicated that there needed to be much more focus at the smallholder and village level for both groups of these countries. So we know that if there's uncontrolled FMD outbreaks in, in the smallholder or village level, this can affect the commercial sectors in all of these countries. And that's usually where we'll get most of the, um, you know, there'll be, be more of an issue when it affects the commercial levels. 55% um, of both groups were only recommending not feeding swill to pigs. And as we've seen in the Philippines, controlling the use of swill or at least, you know, recommending the cooked swill to feed pigs is a, was a key control method in the, um, in the Philippines FMD control program. Promotion of trade of vaccinated animals at the smallholder and village level. Again, that was quite low and this is an area that we really need to improve. The recommendation of systemic antibiotics. Now we saw that that was quite much higher in the FMD endemic countries because again, para veterinaries can create more of an income treating these animals long term with antibiotics rather than promoting the vaccination of them. And then negative disease reporting, so reporting that there's an absence of disease. We are seeing this more frequently in FMD free countries and this goes towards them proving that there's an absence of disease. So when we conducted some statistical analysis, uh, we had univariable binomial re regression. Um, when I made the multivariable mo model, we still only had one variable that was significant. So this was biosecurity programs in the country promote vaccination for FMD or other transboundary animal diseases for incoming animals, um, for incoming new animals. So FMD present countries with FMD, they were 117 times more likely to promote vaccination. So while FMD free countries, you know, they obviously won't be practicing vaccination for FMD, this is still quite important because there are other transboundary animal diseases that they can be affected by. Um, unsurprisingly, systemic antibiotic were promoted for treatment for FMD, 14.4 times more likely in the FMD present countries. A lot of our FMD free countries, they'll use the stamping out or culling procedure, so this result was expected. Um, again, supportive care recommended for, as a treatment op option for FMD. We expect this to be higher in the FMD present countries because they don't have, um, they don't do the, cu the culling procedures. And biosecurity programs in your countries utilising public awareness campaigns on TV. That was higher in the FMD present countries. I think it's still important that FMD free countries do still promote some sort of public awareness because a lot of these countries are still at risk of an FMD incursion. And as we saw in the keynote, there was quite a significant amount of people who haven't actually seen FMD before. So if there is an incursion and people aren't aware of what they're looking for, that provides the opportunity for the disease to spread quite quickly. So conclusions from our study is the act of vaccinating all incoming animals um, at the smallholder or village level, it's, it's an integral factor for regional disease control and I think we need to promote this much more. There needs to be more focus on disease control, so this is biosecurity methods at the village and smallholder level. Uh, improved education and public awareness. Again, sm smallholder and village level, this is where it really needs to focus. And improved uh, surveillance with negative disease reporting. And I think this is something that we can start introducing in these lower income or FMD present countries, get them used to looking for disease, actively looking for it, and proving that we haven't, that they haven't had any of it. So how can we improve biosecurity in a low resource setting? The projects that we work on, this is a constant challenge for us and the use of new technologies with smartphones, access to internet increasing. You know, there, there are a few different ways that we can start promoting the dialogue about biosecurity at the smallholder or village level. So one of our colleagues, Jim Young, he's developed a close the gate online program that you could, that is adaptable to different settings. This one is obviously for New Zealand, it's not a low resource setting, but this is still the type of stuff that we can be introducing in low income countries. So you know, it's just a, you know, you've got a YouTube clip that goes through what quarantine is, you know, they're saying that they look healthy and this is something that we see with our smallholders as well. They think that the animal looks healthy so that there's not a risk of disease, but they can, you know, it can still be in the incubation period and you can still have an outbreak. So just simple, simple programs like this, you know, you can design it so you have a quiz before and after, you can test the increase in knowledge, it's user friendly, it's low cost and it's something that farmers, you know, will be willing to use. Another um, 
system is the Australian Cattle Vets. Last year they developed the BioCheck program. This is a biosecurity plan for farmers, you know, designed to be done in conjunction with a vet and a farmer, and it goes through different issues in the farm, gives them a colour code, and this is something that you can adapt to have, you know, whether you're using smallholders or village, turn it into sort of a village level audit. Um, and it just, it's one of those tools that can promote the discussion and the dialogue between your either national veterinary services or your um, village animal health workers, your community animal health workers, starting to get that dialogue between the farmers um, to make them more aware of the biosecurity practices that they can implement in their village. And I'd like to acknowledge the OIE, our colleagues in Laos and Cambodia, and the CCFMD program, and ACR, who's our funding body, and um, the Mekong Livestock Research Group. That's a group that I'm part of, and we have a website with plenty of blogs and publications. So thank you very much for listening.